Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back. It's been a while since we've uh, done one of these, since we finished Romeo and Juliet. Uh, yesterday, we kind of landed the plane of Romeo and Juliet with the test and study guide. And so if you did well on that, congratulations. If you didn't, eh, it's not going in the grade book. What are you going to do? Um, we are going to begin our poetry uh, unit today. We're going to be uh, I'm going to be going through the PowerPoint with you. You can look at the PowerPoint yourself, or you can watch the video or kind of explain like I do in the class. Um, what I recommend for this PowerPoint is you taking notes, you writing it down, even though we're not in class. Um, pardon me while I silence my dog. <laughs> okay, <laughs> back to business. Um, so yeah, we're starting a poetry in it. Um, write it down. What it does, I've talked about this in class many times, it, it, it maps a different neural pathway than just listening. Listening does one thing in the brain, writing does an entirely different thing. It uh, codes it, it makes you remember it in ways that you would not just listening or, um, you know, following along on a PowerPoint. So, um, if I were you, which I'm not, but if I were, I would write down my notes uh, for this PowerPoint as we go, okay? And uh, the good thing is, instead of me having to pause in class, you can pause me uh, and write down what you need to write down. So I'm going to have uh, the PowerPoint maxed out and just be kind of be talking down in the corner like normal, uh, like with Romeo and Juliet. A um, couple things I want to say about this uh, going forward. Welcome. Welcome, you, you, you erstwhile souls who are continuing on. Uh, into into the uh, into the lit curriculum, many of our uh, fellow soldiers have fallen by our sides and will not be continuing. Um, but go you, go you. Whether you're continuing and just uh, you want the curriculum and to be ready for next year, you're not going to do any of the work. Um, or if you need to do the work to bring your grade up, you know maybe get a, that C to a B or that B to an A. Um, good job. Carry on, carry on. All right. Uh, so we are going to start this PowerPoint talking about poetry. All right. A lot of the stuff is going to overlap with drama. That's why I wanted, I kind of want to do poetry first and then drama, but it doesn't really matter drama than poetry. I was trying to rush so we can get to that performance, but of course the performance never happened. So <laughs> what a world. All right. I'm going to minimize myself and we'll start this PowerPoint. Okay. So if it would just present from current slide, come on. Come on, walk from the beginning. Yeah, this is the beginning. Okay, here we are. So, poetry terms. We have, uh, this is just kind of a table of contents for the PowerPoint, really. We have our general elements. Uh, we're going to talk about figurative language, which we've been talking about all year, um, figurative language. And then sound devices, which are, uh, are unique to poetry and drama. And then forms of poetry and types of poetry. We're going to be looking at several different um, types of poems. Uh, examples of these different types um, in this unit. It's only even a mini unit, by the way. It's only going to be about two weeks um, that we're going to be talking about poetry. I'm going to, I might want you to write your own poem. We'll see if we want to do but I'm thinking that might be what we do. Okay. Um, so there we go. General elements. Uh, we'll get to that first. First, a stanza. A stanza is a formal division of lines in a poem. Uh, prose has paragraphs. Poetry has stanzas, and it's just that division. Uh, in prose, the, the paragraph is set off with the indenting. In poetry, the, they're separated by a line, um, a blank line between, right? Formal division of lines in a poem. This is a unit um, separated by the spaces, as I just said. Types of stanzas. We talked about this with Romeo and Juliet. A couplet. A couplet is two lines. A quatrain is four lines. Those are your most common. Of course, we also have sectets and octuplets and all kinds of things um, with uh, the number of lines. But the couplet and the quatrain are probably the two most common that we see in poetry. The speaker of a poem. The speaker is not the author or the poet, I should say. The speaker is not the poet. It is an imaginary voice put on by the poet. Um, often the speaker might not even have a name. Sometimes he does. Uh, it could be a person, an animal, a thing, some kind of abstraction like death. Perhaps death is the speaker. A lot of times the, the central um, point to understanding a poem is understanding who the speaker is. The speaker is not the poet, except when it is. <laughs> and the poem should make that clear. 
whether the speaker is who the speaker is. Okay, but it could be the poet, but it's not always. That's a very, very common mistake. Okay, um, uh, we see uh, Emily Dickinson writing as a dead person. She says, because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. Okay, we know she's not dead. She's writing that poem. Um, so she is not the speaker. She is the poet. Okay. Tone. What is tone? Tone is something that we've talked about a lot, right? Since the since short story unit. It is the writer's attitude towards the audience and subject. So the tone is in the author or the poet. Mood is something different, right? Mood is in the reader. The mood is in me. The tone is in you, the writer. So the tone is the writer's attitude to the audience and subject. It could be a formal Informal, maybe it's a very serious tone, could be a playful tone, pompous tone. There's a play called uh, My Last Duchess where the speaker is incredibly pompous and full of himself. Uh, some other some other ones. They're bitter, ironic, personal, sympathetic, friendly. I don't need to read them all to you. You can see it. Um, I think one of the, the easiest way to understand tone is sarcastic tone, right? When your parents are like, oh, don't give that tone with me, that's sarcasm. Um, it's the, the, the attitude that you're putting into your words. It drives your parents crazy, right? And so um, that could be one of the tones that a, a poet may choose. A sarcastic tone or a harsh tone, whatever it might be. Illusion, illusion. We've talked about illusion many times. Illusion is a reference to a well-known piece of humanities. Um, something that um, is of, of the humanities. History, uh, plays. Theater is what the word I was looking for. History, theater. It could be uh, one of the holy books, like the Bible. It could be a mythology, a reference to mythology, um, some sort of literary work, an art work. Um, so we have the story. Uh, we didn't read the story, but the gift of the Magi um, is is an allusion to the Magi from the Bible. Connotation. Connotation versus denotation. Okay. Denotation is the dictionary definition of a word. Connotation is the ideas and meanings associated with it. Okay, so a caged bird is literally a bird inside a cage. Well, what connotation do we have from that? We have the idea of a sad, a trapped creature, something, something or someone that cannot escape. So if they say that they are a caged bird, obviously not being literal, there's a connotation to that. Um, yeah. But, but connotation. I think the best example of connotation, do not bark. Looking at you. Best example of connotation for me is the word brother. Brother literally means, and I've probably said this in class before, brother means the son of my parents, who is not me, right? But the connotation of brother is someone who sticks with you through thick and thin, who's always there for you. You can call your best friend your brother. Um, or your brother may be your best friend, and then they're, they're like a true brother to you, right? So there's a connotation to the word brother versus the denotation, which is the literal definition. Okay? All right. Yeah, here we are. I just said all this. Denotation. Okay? So the other one, the lake has the connotation of a vacation spot. The dictionary definition of lake is in the body of water scientific definition, the denotation, but the, the idea, hey, we're going to the lake, there's a lot of things associated with the lake, right? The boat, the jet ski, the skis, um, the beverages, whatever it else. All right. Paradox. A paradox. A statement that seems contradictory, but may be true. Okay? A lot of times these, these will kind of catch a reader off, guard because they're like, wait a minute, that's not making sense. A good example of a paradox, youth is wasted on the young. Okay. Um, another one, the more things change, the more they stay the same. It seems to be contradictory, but it kind of may actually be true, after all. Okay. Bella. So. Okay. I have Harper with me now. Stop barking. She's the she's the catalyst for everything in this one. Tell you what. She is something else. Alright. So back to what we were talking about. Why will I not turn my page? There we go. <laughs> Woo! Symbol. Symbol is uh something that stands for something else. It should have its own meaning, 
but it also represents an abstract idea, right? Um, black symbolizes the country, the scarlet ibis symbolized doodle specifically, but also other people who struggle. Um, we talked about the rose uh, being, you know, it's just a flower on a plant, but it has that uh, association. It symbolizes love and, and uh, everything else. Figurative language, figurative language, very important in a poem. Examining the figurative language is often how you get to the meaning of the poem. Um, so it is writing that is not literal. It's not meant to be interpreted literally. And comparing two to similar things often, um, it will create this very uh, vivid impressions that merely describing something in, in, in other words um, that aren't figurative might not create the same impression. Okay? Examples of figurative language, metaphors, similes, personification. Okay? Um, so here is uh, some lines from a poem. My black eyes are cold, burning, like a low, full jungle moon for the darkness of being. Ooh, okay. So we had a metaphor there. What was the metaphor? Let's see it. My black eyes are coals, burning. But then the burning has its own simile. They're burning like a low, full jungle moon through the darkness of being. Oh, okay. So some uh, it gets a little bit deeper, those three lines, because we have that figurative language, creates this vivid impression. Metaphor, simile, personification, hyperbole is another one. We'll get to it. Okay, figurative language, the metaphor, figure of speech, comparison between two unlike things. Um, it's spoken as if it is something else. Juliet is the sun, right? That is the metaphor. Poetry is a river. There we go. There's the metaphor. Okay. The sky is a patchwork quilt with moving the clouds. You see all these different patches up there. Metaphor. Okay. Simile. Same thing, but uses like or as. You guys know this. We're going to breeze right through this. I'll leave the, uh, leave the screen up there for a minute for you. But the morning sun is like a red rubber ball. We got into, um, yeah, I think we know metaphor and simile pretty well. Okay. Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? That's one of the poems we'll be reading. Um, um, Links to use. Imagery. Imagery, very important in figurative language. Um, it doesn't always have to be figurative. It could be just descriptive, just descri describing it. But in the in the imagery, we could have some figurative language, creating these word pictures. Okay. Um, we have all these details of the five senses. Sight, sound, taste, touch, smell, and movement. Um, sensory language, you say, a lot of times when, I, when it's appealing to your five senses. The ghostly marching on pavement stones. Wind pens. All right. Cool. Personification. When you, it's figurative language where a non-human subject is given human characteristics. The wind danced in the trees. Is personification. Daffodils tossing their heads in sprightly dance. Personification is used extensively in poetry. And... Uh, and with, with and to great effect. Okay. The storm tosses her hair, throws back her head, and closes her eyes. We're not talking about the X-Men storm there. We're talking about a literal storm that's tossing its hair. Okay. It's not bad as a woman. Extended metaphor. A metaphor that is extended throughout the work, throughout the poem, throughout the short story, whatever it might be. Uh, it's a metaphor that is extended. Writing about a subject as if it were something else, and there's repeated, uh, this metaphor is kind of woven through a poem. Uh, Maya Angelou wrote, I know why the caged bird sings. The caged bird was an extended metaphor that uh, extends throughout the entire poem. All right. Broken winged bird that cannot fly becomes life without a dream. All right. Sensory words and language and figurative language, writing appeals to the senses. Easy stuff. Okay. You got this. Onomatopoeia. Super fun to say. Super fun to identify. <laughs> well, I don't know about super fun, but um, onomatopoeia. Really fun to say. Really fun to spell, too. If you're a spelling person, spelling nerd like this guy. <laughs> uh, they're words that imitate sounds. Even the word murmur. Murmur sounds like but it sounds like when people are murmuring, 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 right? Um, a thud. It's a 
Okay, these are all onomatopoeias. Sizzle is an onomatopoeia. It sounds like the word it's like the action is describing. Hiss, fuzz, bang, pop, cuckoo. Okay. Um, we have the example of Poe, Edgar Allan Poe's poem, The Bells, um, which he lists several onomatopoeias there. Let me read it all to you. Assonance, the repetition of vowel sounds. You saw this on your Romeo and Juliet test. Repetition of vowel sounds followed by different consonants and two or more stressed syllables. So like from the Raven, Edgar Allan Poe's poem, The Raven, he says he was weak and weary. Um, that E sound is repeated. Assonance, a child of silence. Ooh, assonance. Okay. All right. Alliteration is another sound device. It is stop whimpering. I'll get to you. Yeesh. Alliteration, the repetition of initial consonant sounds. Initial meaning the first in a word, right? It emphasizes words, imitates sounds, and creates a cool musical effect. An example. I grew like a thin, stubborn weed, watering myself whatever way I could. Okay? The alliteration there is that W, right? Weed, watering, whatever way. Again, back to Edgar Allan Poe, once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary. So this has assonance and alliteration, weak and weary. The air breeze blew, the white foam flew. All right, good. Another sound device that we commonly uh, think is in every poem, but it isn't necessarily, is rhyme. Rhyme, the repetition of sounds at the ends of the word. There could be end rhyme and there could be internal rhyme. End rhyme means it's at the end of the line in the poem. Internal rhyme is it's within the uh, it's within the line. Okay? So the, the end rhyme, it'll be lines rhyming with each other. Internal rhyme, it's the line rhyming within itself. Okay. Um, let's get all this up here. Okay. So, swans sing before they die. It were no bad thing should certain persons die before they sing. Okay? That's an example of end rhyme. Whereas we go back to Edgar Allan Poe's line, once upon a midnight dreary while I pondered weak and weary. It is internal rhyme. Dreary and weary. Okay. There's also a thing called slant rhyme, as we see here. There's exact rhyme, where weary and dreary obviously rhyme exactly. But then there's slant rhyme, where it's similar but not identical. You hear this a lot in music. You hear this a lot in rap, where things uh, the slant is uh, it, it, it's words that don't exactly rhyme, but it's close enough to uh, to do the job. Okay. Um, we have the example of exact rhyme in ball and hall. They're exact. Those hold and bald. They're not exact, but they're close enough where a poet could use both of those in order to rhyme. That's called slant rhyme. Cool, cool. Why does this not work? There we go. Repetition. Repetition is very important. Repetition is very important in rhetoric. Repetition is also important in poetry. Um, and it can be repeating any of the language elements, whether a sound, word, phrase, clause, sentence. Um, and you use it twice, that's repetition. Booyah. Okay. Um, oftentimes it's used for musical effect, for emphasis. Um, if you think about the word nevermore in Raven, it is used with too great um, emphasis um, in, in, when it repeats over and over again. Okay. All right. Um, so these are some examples of elements that can be repeated. Alliteration can be repeated. We can, anything in that line, assonance, rhyme, rhythm, repeat sounds. Um, a refrain, if we call it, if a refrain is a repetition of an entire line or set of lines. Uh, in a song, we often call that a chorus, um, the, the part of the song that is repeated again. It's a refrain in poetry. Okay. Here's an example. You liked winning, you liked writing, you liked all the faces. There's no repetition there. Okay. Uh, expanding on the idea of a refrain, I already said this, but here we are again, regularly repeating line or group of lines in music. This is called a chorus. Um, off the Raven, Nevermore. All right, rhythm. Rhythm is, a, is another sound device. Um, rhythm is the pattern of beats or stresses. Uh, it's also called meter. 
right? We talk about and make pentameter. No, no, no. Tell you what. Um, so rhythm. Uh, we'll talk about the different types of poems, and a lot of times they're defined by their rhythm, whether it's a, a limerick or a haiku, whatever it might be. Um, a sonnet obviously has a specific meter. It's iambic pentameter, which we talked extensively about reading Shakespeare. Okay. There was a young lady named Bright whose speed was far faster than light. It's a limerick rhythm. Okay. There is a rhythm. There is a cadence to the English language. We all speak with a rhythm. We, if we didn't, we'd all sound like robots. If we ex accented every single syllable in the exact same way, we would sound like robots, right? Um, so rhythm is, is very common in everyday speech. And so oftentimes poetry will want to um, exemplify and emulate everyday speech through rhythm. Um, iambic pentameter is Shakespeare's attempt at that. Not attempt. Let's say mastery. Let's say mastery of all right forms of poetry fixed forms uh, in a fixed form poetry you have um, the stanzas are going to be repeated and predictable um, the words in each stanza would rhyme and sound alike length of rhythm and stanzas are related and the number of syllables in the line may be fixed okay so we're going to have several examples of fixed form poetry um, at the end of this powerpoint but then there's free verse <clears throat> Free form or free verse. That's when there is no structure. That's when there is no pattern. Um, that's the kind of poetry that I, I'd like to write back when I used to write a lot of poetry. It doesn't necessarily have a structure or pattern. Some words might rhyme, some do not. Um, lines don't match in any particular number of syllables like their rhythm. The stanzas may be, um, you know, you might have one that's three, one that's five, one that's two, depending on the, the, what, what is necessary for that poem. So, first type of po poetry that we're going to get into is the sonnet. We talked about this briefly. Romeo and Juliet, the prologue, is a si sonnet. It's a 14-line lyric poem. There's formal patterns of rhyme, rhythm, and line structure. Uh, and I have two types here. There's actually more than two types, um, but these are the two most common types, English and Italian. Um, the English or Shakespearean sonnet is what, uh, what's his name? Shakespeare. Yeah, he wrote. He wrote the Shakespearean or English sonnet most often, um, whereas the Italian is is was mostly written by a man named Petrarch, who was a contemporary of Shakespeare. Um, a Petrarchan sonnet is the Italian sonnet. Okay, the the difference is in the structure and the rhyme scheme. Uh, the structure of an English Shakespearean sonnet is three quatrains followed by a couplet. So you go four, 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 and then two. Whereas an Italian will have an octave which is a set of eight lines, and then a sestet, which is six. Okay. We'll get more into sonnets in a bit. Actually, I have a whole power board on sonnets. I know you're looking forward to it, you crazy kids. All right, the next one we're looking at is haiku. You should know what a haiku is. I'm sure you wrote some haikus in middle school, at least. Um, some of you have wrote them in your writer's notebooks this year. Um, it's a three-line verse form. And what defines a haiku is the syllables, not so much the rhyme. So the first and the third lines will have five syllables. The second line, seven syllables. Usually, it's meant to impart some kind of single vivid emotion. It's so small, it's just those three little lines, um, but it should impart some kind of a, a vivid emotional, um, eh, not emotional, but vivid emotion. Okay. Um, oftentimes, it, it depicts images from nature. Haikus very often are depicting images from nature. Okay. Here is a haiku in Japanese and English for you. But <laughs> with this one, the 575 is the Japanese version. An old pond, a frog jumps in the sound of water. Okay, the 575 works in Japanese and also much in English. Okay. A lyric poem. A lyric poem is when it's a musical, musical verse. It uses rhythm, alliteration, and rhyme. It's, uh, it's brief and often is uh, observations and feelings of one speaker. It was called a lyric poem because it was often sung with a lyre in ancient times, which is a little fun. 
A narrative poem. A narrative tells a narrative. A narrative is a story. Okay, so this poem will tell a story. Uh, it could be an epic or a ballad. An epic poem uh, is something like Beowulf, which you guys will read next year in Brit Lit, or uh, Tenth Lit does it as well. Um, it's an epic poem. It's written as a poem, but it's telling this large story about this hero named Beowulf. It's actually the oldest piece of literature in the English language. Beowulf. Although it was Old English, and that's, <laughs> if you can read Old English, well, you're better than me. Um, a ballad uh, is another example of a narrative poem. Um, if you ever read Casey at the Bat, it's one I believe they read in middle school. It's a humorous narrative poem talking about this baseball player named Casey. Uh, Raven, Pose, Edgar Allan Poe's Raven is a very serious narrative poem um, that's telling a story. A ballad. A ballad is a song-like poem, tells a story. Usually it's about romance or adventure. Uh, most ballads are written in four to six line stanzas. And there's regular rhythms and rhyme schemes. Um, but not necessarily defined. Um, but often a ballad will have a refrain, a set of lines that are repeated again. Limerick. Limerick is next. Limerick uh, are, are made famous in, in Scotland. This humorous, rhyming, five-line poem. Uh, specific meter and rhyme scheme. The specific meter, uh, actually the most famous person before we get to that, was Edward Lear. He wrote tons of limericks. All right. Um, you've probably heard different versions of limericks. There was an old person whose habits induced him to feed upon rabbits. When he'd eaten 18, he turned perfectly green, upon which he relinquished those habits. All right? Oftentimes, limericks don't make any sense. <laughs> They're silly. Talking about this man eating rabbits turning green. What? That doesn't make any sense. Famous, though. It's repetitive. It's memorable. Um, it has that A, A, B, B, A rhyme scheme. Okay? Habits, rabbits. Habits all rhyme, 18 in green rhyme, so A-A-B-B-A, -B -B -A, it's five lines. The syllables don't necessarily matter, but usually it does follow this pattern of da 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 So you have the first two with longer, but it's not a specific number of syllables, is what I'm trying to say. But the first two are longer, then the next two are shorter, and then you get back to the longer line. Limerick. Next, we have a concrete poem. A concrete poem is interesting and unique in that the shape of the poem itself is suggesting the subject. Okay, so you look at the poem on the piece of paper. Uh, this is a concrete poem, and it is going to suggest what the subject is. Okay, so for example, we have tears here, right? And they look like tears falling down the face. Um, I've seen poems that, that, that have like an extended metaphor of an hourglass, and so the poem itself is the shape of an hourglass, that kind of thing. Um, they're pretty cool. You should, uh, you should Google some concrete poems. It's interesting. Uh, then we have a dramatic poem uh, in which it uses the techniques of dra drama. Oftentimes these are called a dramatic uh, monologue poem. It's as if usually it'll have a speaker. It'll put on a speaker uh, telling a story. The writer is telling a story usually through the speaker. Okay, the speaker is the character, the character's own thoughts and words. Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven is a dramatic poem where it is a character who is speaking. So that's the key to the dramatic poem, is that there's a character, as if they're from a play, who is giving this, uh, telling, their, telling their thoughts and words. Okay, um, a dramatic monologue is one person speaking to a silent listener. Again, the poem My Last Duchess, which you'll read in British Lit next year, um, is about this duke who's talking about his last duchess to an imaginary listener, and um, I won't spoil it for you. you gotta read it for me. All right, that's it. That's it. So we got it done in our thirty-minute class period, as as we were uh, intending to do. All right, nice, short, and sweet. Tomorrow we're going to read a narrative poem. Um, it is one of the more famous poems. It's called Charge of the Light Grade by Alfred Lord Tennyson. All right. So we have that to look forward to tomorrow. I will see you here. Same bat time, same bat channel. Have a terrific Wednesday. Enjoy it. Oh, and Sophie Lee, happy birthday. All right. See ya. Ah, technical difficulties.